This is the spare key from a Bugatti and it costs over $1,000. Now, it costs $20. That's because it's also shared by every Volkswagen and Audi from the mid 2000s. And it's the same one used in our $2,000 Chinese pickup truck, the Chang Li. Today we are breaking down some of the most egregious examples of expensive parts from expensive cars that are actually cheap parts from cheap cars. I'm James. Welcome to Donut. The first car on this list is a James Bond car. Actually, it's one of the only Aston Martins that James Bond never drove. I'm talking about an Aston Martin DB7. Now this is a weird Aston Martin because it's actually mostly a Jaguar. But what does that mean? James, what does that mean? Well, Ford bought Aston Martin in the early 1990s and Jaguar a few years after, and neither company was in a great financial situation at the time. Jaguar was developing a car to replace the aging XJS. The project was scrapped, but the CEO of Aston Martin saw the design and was like, um, you blokes aren't using that. I'll take a rip around the dance floor with it. And Ford was like, knock yourself out partner so aston took the prototype and they called it project xx they redesigned the body to look more like an aston martin and use existing ties with ford to mitigate some of the development costs at the time ford also was in a partnership with mazda so they leaned on that during development they took outside door handles from the mazda 323 estate which is British for 323 station wagon and the inner door handles and turn signals from I'll give you two guesses the Miata Miata is always the answer then they took the taillights from a Mazda 3 the interior components like buttons stalks and doodads from a Ford Scorpio and bam luxury all in all, it cost Aston Martin and Ford only $30 million to develop the DB7. I spent more than that on lunch this morning. It's called morning lunch. Look it up. It's different than brunch. That's a bargain for a car if you ask me. But that's not the only thing that Aston borrowed from Ford. Some Aston Martin steering wheels are the same ones that you can find in Crown Vicks. Now I know what you're thinking. And yes, James Bond is a cop. Now, it wouldn't be a list of expensive cars if I didn't talk about Lamborghini. Yep, turns out even Lamborghini borrows parts from normal peasant cars. And if you watch Matt Armstrong's YouTube channel, you might know just how many parts are shared with other cars. Matt bought a junky Lamborghini Murcielago a while back on the cheap, 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 cheap. But it was cheap for a reason. It had been sitting for seven years and a bunch of components were either broken or missing, including the engine. So when he looked for parts, Matt was surprised to find out that the climate control module in the Mercy was the exact same one found in the normal British sedan called the Rover 45, which looks like this. Oh my goodness! Oh! If you buy this climate control module as a Lamborghini part, we're talking 1,500 to 5,500 bones. But if you buy it for your Rover 45, 25 euros. That's a deal. It's the exact same part. Only one of them is from the Lamborghini website, where, by the way, you can also buy kids clothes for some reason. Even more insane though, is the exact same climate control module can be found in a Pagani Huayra. That's a $1.4 million hypercar. I almost wrecked one once. <laughs> During the restoration, Matt also noticed that the front turn signals had a Ford logo on them. He followed the money, and after a bit of digging, he found out that they were from a Eurospec first gen Ford Focus certified bonkers, if you ask me. But the Murcielago is not the only Italian exotic that shares parts with a bargain American car. What about Maserati? Surely, Maserati, a company known for legendary build quality and holding their value, they make all their parts in house, right? Wrong! 
dead wrong. Maserati is owned by a giant automotive conglomerate called Stellantis. Stellantis also owns Chrysler and all of Chrysler's brands like Jeep, Ram, and Dodge. And what do companies do when they own other companies? They cut budgets and replace good stuff with crappy stuff. This is Dylan, and Dylan has a YouTube channel called Luxury Lives On. He found out for himself when he took his Maserati Quattroporte around to different Chrysler dealerships to see if car dealers could identify Chrysler parts on his Italian sports car. In the end, Dylan was able to identify 16 parts in his Maserati that were sourced from Chrysler. Take the window switch panel, for instance. If you get it from Maserati, it costs $400. But if you get the exact same part from a Jeep Cherokee, guess how much it costs? $30. Now there's a lot of chatter on the internet saying that earlier gen Quattroportes share the same taillights as the Daewoo Nubira. And although they do look very similar, they are not the same lights. GM owned Daewoo and not Chrysler. So let's put an end to this, please. There's been enough bloodshed. On the plus side though, the engine in the Quattroporte is built by Ferrari. So that's kind of a fun version of all this crap. Now the Quattroporte is a good example of what car companies do all the time across multiple brands. They love to reuse parts over different models because that means that they're saving money on development costs. And you know what companies who own other companies like to do? Save money, no matter what. Even if it makes the stuff worse and the people who make it sad. You may have heard of this referred to as parts bin. And if a car has enough of these universal parts, people will call it a parts bin special. It's really just a way to reuse already existing parts instead of designing and producing new parts for every car. It's also a cheap way to solidify the same design language so that every car from that manufacturer has a similar look and feel to it, which is nice. It's called branding. Look it up. One of the most famous parts bin specials ever is a little car named after a big old snake. Of course, I'm talking about the Hyundai Anaconda. JK, talk about Dodge Viper. Legend has it Dodge only gave the development team a budget of $50 million to develop the Viper, which is basically nothing in the automotive industry. For context, the Lexus LS400 famously cost over a billion dollars to develop, and that was in 1989 when Michael Keaton was the only Batman. I'm Batman. But the Viper team didn't have a billion dollars, which meant that they had to get creative. First stop, the parts bin. So these sickos at Dodge cobbled together the Frankenstein Viper with mirrors from a Dodge Stealth, power steering motor from a Jeep, the steering assembly from a Dodge Dakota, fog lamps from Audi, heck, the dang old thing's got the bolt pattern from a Dodge Ram, six lug supercar, why the heck not? But one of the weirdest ways that they saved money was by taking the headlights from a failed project by BMW. After the failed BMW project was scrapped, Dodge came into the room and they were like, what are y'all gonna do with its eyes? They reworked the entire front end of the Viper to accommodate these headlights because that was cheaper than creating headlights from scratch. At that point, the whole car was made out of clay. Dodge Viper branded parts are some of the most egregiously overpriced parts on the market. And here's a good example. We found this official Mopar Dodge Viper gas cap for sale online for $1,545. Or you can get this one that we actually bought that fits a Viper for $19. You wanna buy an OEM hood for your Viper? 18,000 bucks. If only building cars was as easy as using today's sponsor, Shopify. Shopify is an all-in-one commerce platform that we use as the backbone of our merch business. Regardless of technical ability or experience, Shopify makes it easy to start, grow, and manage a business. They even have tools for newcomers like their business name generator and Shopify Learn. Plus, their easy to use templates can get you started quickly. Customization is easy too. Hmm. You know, Maybe I should apply my newfound customization skills to building this car.
Yeah, that's better. Join Dona and the millions of other merchants by growing your business with Shopify today and get a free trial at shopify.com slash donutmedia or just click the link below. Dodge Viper wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for this next company. Now, when Dodge's mommy Chrysler owned Lamborghini in the late 80s and early 90s, Lamborghini helped them develop the massive eight liter V10 for the Viper. And in turn, Chrysler helped fund the development for the successor of the Countach. I am of course talking about my favorite car named after a successful video game franchise, the Diablo. It was in production from 1990 to 2002 and one of the distinguishing features of the Diablo was its wicked toy. Pop up and lights. Pop up and down headlights. Oh. That is until pop up headlights were banned because pedestrians didn't want to get killed by headlights. Lamborghini had to redesign the headlights for the Diablo in order to keep selling it. But timing was not on their side. Much like timing and location are not on mine. Move to the airport, they said. Shoot in the parking lot, they said. <laughs> you know, they ended up dragging their feet, and when they finally finished the redesigned headlights, they didn't pass Department of Transportation regulations in the US. So Lambo did the next best thing. They licensed the headlight design from Nissan? Uh? Now, as much as we'd love to see Ultima headlights on the front of a Lamborghini, uh, they went with a more avant-garde design. I'm talking about the headlights from the critically acclaimed Z32 300ZX. Some of the coolest headlights ever made. One of the first cars I ever liked. Now, it's been debated for decades whether these headlights were actually from Nissan or if they were just copycats. But we're here to end this debate, or rather, Rob Dom did months ago. In his video, Rob shows that the Diablo lights are 100% Nissan headlights. Lambo did raise them up a little bit by adding a small strip of carbon fiber to cover up the Nissan logo, but you're not gonna believe the price difference that this little carbon fiber sticker makes. Now, if you buy a used Lamborghini Diablo headlight off of eBay, you're looking to spend about 2,000 bucks. But if you buy a 300ZX headlight, it's more like 130 bucks. Turns out that that 10 inch strip of carbon fiber, which has a no performance value at all, is theoretically valued at $1,700, which is insane. But you know what's even more insane than that? How about swapping out the chassis of one of the most beloved rally cars ever with an SUV chassis? Let me explain, okay? The Mitsubishi Lancer Evolution was a compact all-wheel drive beast that was absolutely amazing for nine out of 10 generations. It battled with the Subaru WRX STI in the highest levels of rally racing for almost two decades. Tommy Mikkinen drove one. And that kid with the forehead from Tokyo Drift, he drove one too. Then the Evo 10 came out and it was different. Aside from getting rid of the beloved 4G63 engine, they also chose to save money by using the chassis of a Dodge Journey. Yes, this car sits on the same platform as this car. This isn't the first time that Dodge's parent company Chrysler teamed up with Mitsubishi. The two have been tangoing for years. The partnership started all the way back in the 70s as Diamond Star Motors, which is a sick ass name and an homage to both of their badges. Pretty metal, kind of cowboy, slightly satanic, very sick. This joint venture produced, among others, the Mitsubishi Galant, which was rebadged as the Dodge Colt, then later the Eclipse, which was rebadged as the Eagle Talon and the Plymouth Laser. Cut to 15 years later, 2007, and Mitsubishi is about to release the 10th generation of their Lancer Evolution. This wasn't a great time for Mitsubishi, financially speaking. So they chose to go with a more universal platform to cut down on development costs. This platform, the GS platform, was nicknamed Project Global for this very reason. It would be the last collaboration between the two companies. And what a chassis it is. 
The GS chassis is shared by legends that people love, like the Eclipse Cross, the Outlander, and the Delica. But it's also used on other legends like the Dodge Caliber, the Jeep Compass, Chrysler, Sebring, and the Dodge Avenger. Now there is a part of this story that is actually kind of cool. Dodge was developing a rebadged Evo 10 called the Dodge Lancer that never made it into production. But some dude got pictures of the prototype parked in a lot outside of the Detroit. It is very much a Lancer, but the grill is changed to fit Dodge's design language at the time. This thing went on to become the Dodge Caliber and the Evo went on to become a dead car in hell. <laughs> Our last example on this list is the single most reused part ever. Take a look at the Lamborghini Diablo or the Pagani Zonda or this Saline S7. What do they all have in common? One of the easiest ways to save money in the auto industry is by not designing your own lights. For instance, the Koenigsegg CCX has reverse lights from an FDR X7, the McLaren F1, the fastest car on earth for a decade has the tail lights from a bus called a Bova. A Bova? That sounds like the fat part of an old lady. Lotus Esprit has the same tail lights as the Toyota AE86. And I'm not sure which one of those is the expensive one. Lights are hard to design. So sometimes it's easier to leave it to the pros. In this case, the pros is a German company that's hella good at making lights. I am, of course, talking about Hella. They make headlights, they make tail lights, they make trail lights, they make snail lights. And one shining example is the Hella 4169 tail lights. 4169, nice. Now you can find these bad boys on the Celine S7, Lamborghini Diablo, Pagani Zonda. It just goes to show you that if it looks cool and saves you a buck, you can do it and still make a unique car. Thank you guys so much for watching this video and everything else on Donut. Hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, hit that bell so you don't miss anything. We upload videos all the time. Some of the videos we upload are on another channel called Donut Podcasts, where we have the number one automotive podcast on the planet. All right. I love you.